If you would, please turn to Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Now, that's a familiar passage. Many of you may have it memorized, but that's our text for the morning. And it's very important that we recognize what it says. If you're not a Christian, you must understand the principles taught therein. And as Christians, we need to be reminded of it daily. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Again, Matthew seven thirteen and 14. Our Lord did not, as we might say today in our vernacular, pull any punches when it came to showing the people what God demanded of them. Obligations that they and they alone, and the same is true of us, must discharge in order to become a Christian and in order to live a faithful Christian life. I want us to focus in on some principles here, but I would have you note that Luke records dealing with the same idea in 13.23 in answer to this question, Lord, are there few that be saved? Now the Lord then said, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. I think I could stop the lesson here for all those who believe the Bible is the Word of God. And you would understand if you didn't understand anything else. That to be acceptable to God, to become a Christian and live the Christian life, there are demands that God places on your life. There are things that you must do that many and most will not do. There are sacrifices, things very important to you, that you must make. And that reminds us, of course, Paul's writing in Romans chapter 12, that we're to present our bodies as living sacrifices unto God. Workmen that need not to be ashamed to incorporate 2 Timothy 2.15 in it, right in dividing the word of truth. When he says our bodies, that's the only way we can function in this world, is through our bodies. When death comes, that's James' wording, the body apart from the spirit is dead. So the definition of death is when the real you, your inner man, the spirit that is fathered by God, leaves this physical body. It will not be able to be controlled by you then. It will return to the dust through decomposition from whence it was made. Thus in this body, it has all the appetites that are peculiar to this world, for God made it to fit into this world, to function in this world. All those appetites that might lead us away from doing what the Bible says have been suppressed. That means the spirit in the body has been suppressing those things, putting them under the control of Christ by the will which our spirit has to bring our bodies under control to Christ. Thus, we present our bodies a living sacrifice. All that's involved in what is said in Matthew 7 and Luke 13. Now notice, Jesus is emphasizing that the way that leads to life will be walked only by a few, comparatively speaking. Consider what you have when it comes to the example from the Old Testament that the writer of Hebrews used to encourage Christians in Hebrews chapter 11, as to Moses' conduct on this earth. The scripture says, by faith, and remember, faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So by the word of God, 
by the faith formed in Moses by the word of God for him at that day and time, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Notice he makes a choice. He resolves in his mind. He wills, he chooses, rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Why did he do this? The writer of Hebrews says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward, Hebrews 11, 24 through 27, which means he looked at the reward in heaven as greater than anything Egypt could offer. And that's the same today. But most people will not choose as Moses chose. Those riches in Egypt are too powerful. And if we live on the plane of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, then you'll be blinded to the straight and narrow way. Now, consider this, taking this very familiar fundamental passage and fundamental truth it teaches. He talks about the broad gate and the wide way. Notice these profound truths taught so simply. The broad gate and the wide way. That's just going through life, pleasing yourself, living for the here and now, thinking of nobody but you except as what they may do for you. There's a host of people like that. They enter into marriages in the same way. What can my wife do for me? What can my husband do for me? It's always this me business. It's not the idea when you become one as husband and wife that it's a we from now on with the different roles of husband and wife. And of course, for those who follow the Bible, as the Bible assigns us those roles and the conduct of each one of them. So the way that the world offers is always going to allow you and urge you to be different from what the Bible teaches. The Bible will restrict you. It will prohibit it will say, don't let the present world or your time here in the flesh choose the things of the flesh. Thus, Jesus talked about the straight and narrow way as the path that must be followed if we want eternal life. So there must be a strong desire for eternal life that would cause us to put down the desires of the flesh. The word straight, you've heard me say this many times, but it's not original with me, S-T-R-A-I-T. In the King James Version, does not mean in a straight, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, it doesn't mean in a straight line, such as a straight line up this middle aisle of the auditorium doesn't mean that at all, but it means a confined place. There are obstacles to be dealt with if you would walk that narrow, hemmed-in passage. And in the case of the way to heaven, it's narrow, it's straight, it's hemmed in on all sides by the will of heaven. Take, for example, the person who loves his alcohol. Now, picture that alcohol in a great big barrel on his back. And he is going to walk the state in their way. But with that barrel on his back, he can't get in. Now, you take anything that's contrary to God's will that's a part of a person's life, 
and make it that big thing on his back. And because of the authority of Christ that lays those restrictions making the path straight, then he tries to enter in, but those burdens stop him. Even if a person enters in, and then embraces the affairs of this present world that contradict the truth he's to live by, he's stuck, he can't get down to the end of it, but it's the end of it, that straight and narrow way, where eternal life is. Now the Lord's talking about people becoming Christians here. And how much of this world allures them? There are a host of people who because of friends and family, and their aspirations before they heard the gospel of this present world, wealth or striving after it, and so on. When they see what it is to live daily, the Christian life is taught in the New Testament, then they have that burden, that big bulk on them, and they can't enter that narrow, hemmed-in passage, narrow and hemmed-in because of the authorized way that Christ has laid down in the New Testament that people are to do to become Christians and to live the Christian life. So the straight and narrow way is a metaphor for making difficult choices in life and living in a way that is steadfast and consistent with the will of heaven presented by Jesus in the Bible. So you would have another very basic passage we refer to most often, John 14, 6, where Jesus says of himself, I am the way. There's that straight and narrow way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me, but by me. Now that was too much for the Jews. Oh, we're children of Abraham. We were born genetically a Jew, and in that we are going to go to heaven because we're circumcised to keep the law. And remember, Jesus said of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. Which means he can change the whole genetic structure from a rock to make a Jew. So that's the point that needs to be kept in mind about living this life. When you find religions teaching you that, oh, it's no big deal to be a Christian, we as the Lord's church and all the New Testament means by that, and Christians and all the New Testament means by that, need to be showing people that there is a cost to being a disciple of the Lord. And the Lord taught on that cost of discipleship. What gets pictured in most concepts, false concepts of Christianity, is no big deal. Even the way that the denominations present salvation from sin is just simply to humble your heart, acknowledging Christ as Savior, and ask Him to save you. No big deal. Because then they'll talk about a grace of God that pretty well allows you to dibble and dabble in any of the ways of the world just as long as you don't involve yourself too much. And even then they try to make a way whereby that can be dealt with. I have never sat in a funeral preached by a denominational preacher where that preacher did not, regardless of the way the person's funeral they're holding, regardless of the way that person lived, that he didn't preach him in heaven. Because of their false concept of the grace of God and their false way of being saved. The Lord's teaching about the opposite. There are difficult choices. For some people to obey the plan of salvation, which involves repentance, it's going to change their whole relationship with their family. It's going to change the whole relationship with a lot of things and different people according to their situation. And they're simply unwilling to make those sacrifices. The straight and narrow way is the trail that was blazed by our Lord. Now, I may need to mention something about what does it mean to be a trailblazer. 
we might do well to remember the early times of our country as the people left the East Coast and journeyed west. There were those people that preceded the general movement west of the ordinary people, and they would actually blaze a trail. They would actually mark trees to where you could see where this person had gone, and he was looking for the way that they could transport things as pioneers moved. And so they would follow the course laid out. And they would go whether it went this way or that way because that fellow had the best interest of the pioneers to come with their families and wagons and so forth to get them to where they were going. It's Jesus who blazed the trail for us. That is, he marked out the trail to heaven, the way to heaven for others to follow. And he's left that in words so we can understand in the gospel of Christ. Think of Hebrews 2.10. Jesus is called the captain of our salvation. In the same book, chapter 6, verse 20, he's called the forerunner. And then in chapter 12, verse 2, he's called the author and finisher. It's interesting. A forerunner goes before, like John the Baptist came to prepare the Jews to receive Christ, so he came before him. But now also Jesus is called the author and finisher. Forerunner, author, and finisher. And it's of our faith, the system of faith, the New Testament that we have. In other words, from start in the middle and all the way through it to the finish, Jesus has laid out the trail. Jesus is the one then who blazed the trail from earth to heaven. And he did not say, now I know at some areas this is so hard and the decisions you'll have to make, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off this way, make it easier on you. He didn't do that. What he did was to say, this is the way and there is no other way, and if you go down this way, you must adhere to my will. You ever notice that? He says in John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. In other words, he said, here's the way, there is no other way. And whatever it demands of you to walk that way, you'll just have to be that way. He said it this way, take up your cross and follow me. Paul taught Timothy, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But if we stay on that way, you'll get to the path, you'll get to the destination that path leads. Think about leaving the East Coast, going to the West Coast. And all those ways in between as the population of America moved gradually across the nation. Finally, if you, stay, if you leave the East Coast going West and you stay on it, you're going to have to confront the Pacific Ocean somewhere on the end of it. That's so simple. It's so plain. Now, there can be all sorts of things between the East Coast and the West Coast that might say, I, I think we'll stay here and put down roots. There were a lot of people after the war between the states because of the destruction of the South who decided to go West that probably never would have if it hadn't been for the war. The whole host of Texas, a lot of people, a whole host of people came to Texas. You may not be that much aware of how many people moved into Texas because of the Civil War and the desolation of the South that came this way, but they did. We're most of the time concentrating on the history of Texas as it has to do with Austin and all of that down at the beginning back in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. But there was a host of people that moved west. A lot of them went down to Texas. But if you go back to old families in East Texas and Arkansas, a lot of them stopped along the way. They found what they wanted. My great-grandfather on my mother's side, his parents moved down out of Kentucky, basically headed for Texas. They got Southern Arkansas, found what they wanted, and he actually bought land for 50 cents an acre, <laughs> maybe cheaper at times. And that's where they stopped. Well, Christians can't do that. Following the metaphor the Lord laid down, he can't do that. And Satan is going to say, well, you meant to go to Texas, 
But why not stop here? Why not stop here? Well, with what they did, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But making it apply to the metaphor the Lord gave, you don't need to stop along the way. You need to go, you need to go down here. Or if you're going out to Oregon, or if you're going out to California, as so many did, then you need to keep on going if that's your destination. Well, what about to heaven? Where can you stop along the way of life and cease to follow the trail Jesus blazed and expect heaven to be your home. We follow Jesus' steps. And when we follow our Lord's steps as set out in the Word of God, then what are we doing? We're walking that trail the Lord blazed, the Lord set out, that He marked out. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. For even here unto were ye called, of course, we're called by the gospel, God's power to save us from sin. Here and too were you called, Peter says, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Now, an example is a pattern that ye should follow in his steps. Now, that has to do with suffering for the cause of Christ and suffering the same reason Christ suffered. And that's all a part of it. You don't see many people today appealing to folks to obey the gospel by saying, come on and suffer. Look to Christ. He's the only way to heaven. You have to walk the trail He's blazed. It's the only trail that leads to heaven. And it's sent out in the rightly divided words of the Bible, specifically the New Testament. But now when you start down that path, you must understand to begin to start down, you have to believe in Him as the Son of God. And all that that implies about your life from here on out. You must keep the commandment to repent of your sins. At this point, you resolve that whatever way you've lived in the past, contrary to His will, from henceforth it will not be so. Your will will be to follow Him wherever that path leads you. And no matter what men may do to you, you're willing to publicly confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God in keeping His commandments, Romans 10, 10, Matthew 10, 32. That gets a lot of people in trouble right now. Going to some of these countries that are primarily Islamic and boldly proclaim that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. See what it gets you. In Malaysia to this day, the government does not allow an actual approach by Christians to native Malaysians. And it's nothing for them if they do obey the gospel to lose everything as far as their family is concerned. You know, the cost of discipleship becomes such a reality to those people. Thus, we must realize that even becoming a Christian, and that's basically where the Lord's addressing, or at the point of salvation the Lord's addressing, when He gave this particular metaphor. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. These other things mean more to folks than does the way to heaven. So that's the way it is. And when you become a Christian, the choices you must make, whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him, Colossians 3, 17. You will choose those things, even they're not right or wrong in themselves, but you will choose those things that will encourage you to more easily obey the truth that is obligatory upon all of us. Because you want heaven to be your home. That's the most important thing on earth, heaven to be my home. Not whether my family's happy with me. Not whether whoever in the world is happy with me. Is God pleased with my thinking and actions? In 1 John 2, 6, John says to Christians, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Let's study Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John and just see how Jesus lived. The choices he made, how he viewed the world, what he sought to do. Of course, I know where it led him. He was despised and he was rejected. He himself would say, you know, the foxes of the have their holes and the birds of there have their nests, but what would we Americans do? The Son of Man has not any place to lay his head. Look what we possess. Look what we have. We roll in the laps of luxury. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. 
as long as we don't get there and stay there and it causes us to commit sins of omission of what God expects us to do or commission in the process of getting there and using what we have even if it's earned honestly. We must remain on the trail, the path, until we reach the end. I've already mentioned that. It's not a matter of starting out. The Lord has a lot to say about it if you start out and then look back at what you're giving up. and He says you're not worthy of the kingdom of heaven if you do that. If the allurements of the world still pull you, you're not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. In Luke 9 and verse 62, And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. That's pretty plain, isn't it? If you'll notice, all these are so bold, so powerful, and yet when they're understood in practice, they'll take you to heaven. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever plowed, and I don't know how many of you that have have used a horse or a mule or something like that. But it's hard to make a straight road, whether it's from here to the back door or across 40 acres. And if you take your eyes off of it, especially if you start looking back, it won't be straight. In Hebrews 10, 38, writing to Christians who are being tempted to look back, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. We have to resolve to reach the end of the trail. Faithfulness demands that we stay true to our commitment to walk the straight and narrow way. The trail that Jesus has blazed as the forerunner. You know what the only alternative, if you don't do that, is apostasy and the loss of your soul. There's no other thing but that. Get on the trail, whatever it takes you to sacrifice to get on that trail, and live on that trail regardless of sacrifices until you get to the end. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. 2 Peter 2 and verse 20 says that if we're not faithful, our latter end will be worse than the first. When you know the truth, you know the way, you know the importance of it, but you turn away from it for the affairs of this world that you left at one time. And if you read that passage I just mentioned, you will see that Jesus says by the Spirit that you're like the dog that vomited up whatever in his sick and turns to eat it again. Now that is, we've probably seen dogs do that, but that is just awful. But that's how God says He sees the person who starts out and quits. Or like a sow that was washed, but you turn it loose, it's going to go to the mud hole. That's how God sees the member of the church who starts out but then quits. That's pretty gruesome, pretty plain, pretty ugly. But who used those descriptive terms? Who caused those thoughts to come to our mind? The Holy Spirit did through the pen of Peter. Second Timothy 4 and verse 10 talks about Demas, who Paul says, left me having loved this present world. Now, I think sometimes we say he must have become an idolater. He may have. He must have become whatever is listed in the works of the flesh in Galatians 5. But he didn't have to, to leave the work of Paul. He could have just said, I just can't stand this pressure anymore. I just can't stand what you go through when you stick close to Paul and you teach what he taught. It may mean that he didn't begin to curse and to swear and to lie and to become a part of the pagan world again. I'm not saying he didn't, but I'm saying that doesn't necessarily mean that he did simply because Paul said he's forsaken me having loved this present world. Now, there's times when Christians need to stand up and be counted, and when they do, it's going to put them in a bad light with their neighbors, with maybe their family, with others, maybe with the government or their employer. And they just choose to be quiet, sit on the back seat. 
Let somebody else take the heat. Well, I know how the Lord thinks about that. How do I know? He told me. And he wrote those things to Christians, saying, don't beat that way. Whatever Demas did, Paul says he loved this present world, and that was the reason that he did it. And a lot of people like that. The more we realize. And this trail, this gospel way, if you want to call it that, does not change. In fact, if you go back to even trails people make, the good trails, those that bring the sojourner from one end to the other as safely as possible, they don't change. Any earthly trail, though, will undergo some kind of changes. But if we desire to arrive in heaven to be with God for eternity, and we cannot change the Lord's path. Well, how would you change the Lord's path? Well, you could alter the plan of salvation. Just entering Christ. You can say all you have to do is believe and believe on and you'll be saved. And then you can ignore repentance, confession of faith in Christ, and immersion in water is baptism by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins. You can ignore all that. Because you convince yourself salvation is by faith only. And thus you just ignore those other passages. You can't get on the trail that leads to heaven if you do. You may be the finest moral person who's helped people right and left, but you're not a Christian. Most of the denominational world thinks they're Christians, and they're not. Can you imagine coming into the end of your life and stepping over into eternity, having been so active in the denominational church, professing Christ as Savior, but you never obeyed Him in being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins? In fact, you fought against that idea. And then you're going to have to be judged simply and only by the Word of God. What a terrible, terrible surprise a revelation it is when people think they're ready to meet God and they're not. And the Lord gives us pictures of the judgment where people say, Lord, did we not this, that, and the other? You notice he doesn't argue with them. He just says, depart. The time of preparation and study and thinking and understanding the truth and determining to live by it at all costs is now. The day of judgment, no hope for those who did not do that. You can cry out all your whatever it is in eternity. Lord, I'm sorry. Give me another chance. There won't be. I see now where I was wrong. Too late. In this life, that's not the situation. We're in the land of beginning again. You fall by the wayside, there's still the plea of God to repent of your sins or to obey the gospel to become a Christian. We can begin. We think about that. But when you reach the other side, as it were, when you leave this world, there is no second chance. There is no repentance that will be acceptable. None whatsoever. What about the people that comes to the church? Church not important. The organization of the church is not important. The elders aren't important. Deacons aren't important. The qualifications they must meet to be scripturally qualified, they're not important. The only thing is just love one another. The role of women, the role of husbands, the role of wives, the role of children set out in the Bible, none of that's that important. Just love one another, love God, believe that Christ saved you, and that's all. His grace just covers you, and that's all there is to it. So, you don't pay attention to those blaze marks on the tree that says you must go this way. When it comes to worship, how many will worship God today, use a mechanic and certain music, or do no tell what else? Won't work. We must act by the authority of Jesus Christ. Why, even churches of Christ, put that in quotes, have become weak on this over the last years. We, we tend to say, well, don't give that guy idea... Don't give that person the idea that if, that if he dies the way he's living now, he's going to be lost. Why not? Jesus did. And I kind of preach his word and not do that. God, our destination, does not change. The prophet Malachi 3, 6 made that very clear. I, the Lord, change not. And Jesus, the path to God and his gospel does not change. To the Jews who are being tempted to leave Christ, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
plan of salvation is the same day it was last year and a thousand years ago and so on. Proverbs 4, 26 through 27, notice what he says. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all the ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Still using the idea of the way to heaven and living a godly life is on a trail that you must walk and be careful where you step. If I were to tell you that there's a minefield out here and there's just one little way through it, you'd be very particular about it. Well, that's exactly what we have in life. Thus we're taught, see then that ye walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time. Buy it back. It's been used too often to do as you please. Now buy it back by doing it as God wants it done. Redeeming the time for the days are evil. Now the devil's going to tell you the days are good, but the Bible says the days are evil. Now which we're going to believe and order our lives accordingly. This trail brings the reward. That is the trail that Jesus blazes is the only one that leads to the fountain of living waters. John chapter 4 and verse 14, Jesus said, But whoso drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. Again, notice Revelation twenty two seventeen, right at the end of the Bible. It hasn't changed. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, that's as broad as the human race, and whosoever will, let him take. You've got to do something. Let him take the water of life freely. You must enter in the straight and narrow way. When this life is over, we can expect God and heaven. That's our goal. God wants that to be our goal. He wants the expectation of glory in heaven with Him to guide us. Romans 8, 24 says we're saved by hope. It has its place in keeping us faithful. We look beyond this old world and the temptations of Satan and the evil that's in it. And we see glory and honor and majesty and peace and a glorified resurrected body like Christ has to live forever beyond all the things that plague this life. But it's only for those who walk the straight and narrow way, who consider the cost of discipleship, who are willing to bear their cross daily and follow Christ. Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate. It's talking about exercising self-control. In all things, nothing left out. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. People of the world who are going to be good in athletics and other things will be temperate. They'll choose those things that will help them accomplish what they want. And you've never talked. We'll just take athletics again. You've never talked to a champion who is whatever field of athletics it would be. If you look at their lives, they deprive themselves a whole lot to be able to be the best they can, no matter what natural talents they have. And if people can see that of this present world, why can't we see it when it comes to the way to heaven? Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. There's no way with human words, even when we use those of the Bible that describe heaven, for us to understand and plumb the depths of the glorious, majestic reward that awaits the faithful, who have walked faithfully the trail Jesus blazed. And who will someday hear, well done, a good and faithful servant. No way for us to grasp all of that. But we can grasp enough. We can know that there is a place where there is no death and no decay. 
We can know that there's a place where there's no disease, where there's no strife, where everything is done flawlessly according to the will of heaven, and in a state that's beyond our mind to grasp as to the resurrected body. Rather than what is wrong with people that they don't want that, and they're willing to sacrifice anything to obtain it. Why anchor yourself to this life? Why not make up your mind Whatever time I've got here will be given over to the study of God's Word, understanding it and living it and teaching it to others and contending for it. Straight and narrow way is the trail that Jesus blazed. The trail that once begun must be followed. The trail that does not change. And the trail that brings eternal reward. If you're not a child of God this morning, we urge you to heed these things and realize that we have now and we could be ushered into eternity before we even get home today. Someday we will be. We don't know when that time will come or how it will take place. So we urge all members of the church to resolve and renew their strength in determining to know the truth and live it and defend it. For those who are not Christians, we urge you to obey the gospel now while yet you have time. And while the arm of salvation from God is outstretched to you, pleading with you to obey the gospel. The child of God, if you need to repent, then we urge you to do that. Their private sins known only to you and God, take care of it there. But if they brought reproach on the church because as a child of God you've lived in the way the world lives, you need to take care of it in that way. There's nothing wrong with asking our brethren to pray for us. It's right. It's wholesome. It's part of being faithful that we pray for one another, that we help one another, that we encourage one another. Because we're all humans. We're all on that straight, straight and narrow way path. The only way to lead to heaven. So we want to help one another walk that path. If you need to obey the gospel, then we urge you to do so while we stand and while we sing.